my slides. Oh, slides are up. Yeah. So, um, hi everyone. Um, Dominic and I are super excited to be here. First edition of Revo.js. Um, it's been pretty impressive so far, and I want to give a like we want to give a personal shout out to the transcribing because it's like what is that? That's so impressive. That's, it is amazing. That's so awesome. So um, today, Dominic and I are going to talk. But before we start, I want to start by asking you a question. And that question is, do you still understand the code that you wrote six months ago? Who understands the code? Show of hands. I'm going to put mine down because I don't. Do you, Dominic? I don't because I always, I, I, I don't even remember what I had for breakfast yesterday. So how am I supposed to understand code that I like wrote six months ago? Same. It's, it's super hard. And, and do, for, for the people who still had their hands up, do you understand the code that your code coworkers wrote six months ago? Or how easy is it to understand the code that someone else wrote? And then even, even further, what if you need to change something to code that someone else wrote? That's, this is kind of how it makes me feel sometimes. No. No? No. Because, uh, well, the, the problem is that code should express intent, right? It should be expressive. It should be easy to understand. If we take a look at our code or somebody else's code, it should be easy to understand what it does and what it's supposed to do, right? But this is actually not that easy because often we lack documentation, so it, it is a systematic problem. Now the question is, what can we actually do about this? Well, what do we do? What do we tell our boss? Well, I guess we just, well, we tell them we throw it away and we rewrite it from scratch. That's easy. That's, that might not be the most budget-friendly thing, and our manager might not be super happy with this, but it's easy, but, right? But, well, we're, we're freelancers, so that's like a good thing, right? More work for us? More work, definitely, yeah, for that's, us. That's so I guess thing. it's good. good thing. So, Quentin, come, what, what can we do about this? Well, well, one thing we could do is we could maybe look at other ways that we communicate, and one of those ways that we communicate is using text messages. So if Dominic sends me this text message, and uh, I ask, and he asked me, like, what did you do last night? I could send him this. And Dominic, do you understand what this means? I guess it's supposed to be you, although you don't have a beard. Um, you played tennis, you took a shower, you had an awesome beard, probably local, hopefully. Um, you went home, you watched some TV, Netflix, and you went to bed. That sounds like an awesome day. That's, that's exactly correct. Only using a couple of emojis, Dominic was able to infer what I mean, and you probably know, know what this means, like, in six months, right? Easy. Easy. So if we look at the way we communicate, emojis have drastically changed the way that we do that. According to some very re reliable source we found online. Is it <clears> Wikipedia? No, it, no, it's not. Um, last year, we sent about 900 million messages on Facebook, which were just emojis. I read half of the messages contain emojis. So of that's, all messages. That's super pow powerful, right? It is. Very expressive. So why don't we put two and two together? So this is standard Angular code, right? So we have a couple of divs here. We have an input element. We also have a to-do item component. And we use these Angular um, directives. Well, what if we put two and two together and replace these and make them more expressive by using emojis? Wow. How awesome does that look, right? I mean, who doesn't want to use emojis in their code? Nobody, probably. All of us want to use that. I think this is actually the best idea we've ever had, right? I guess so. I, I think so. So today, Dominic and I want to show you how you can build an emoji syntax into Angular. And to do that, we're going to look at how Angular works, uh, what the compiler is, how it is built up, and how we can maybe hack in our own syntax. Maybe. Maybe. But yeah. before we do that, a little bit about ourselves. So uh, Dominic and I both work for StackBlitz, which hopefully everyone knows. It's an online editor, uh, which, is, which is very awesome. Um, we both do trainings uh, either to ThoughtRam or StrongBrew, and we're both Google developer experts. But another thing that we do, so we have, like this was one of our ideas, the emoji syntax, but we've also built something called the Angular Checklist, which you can find at angular-checklist.io. And this is a list of curated best practices that we feel should be in every Angular application. And we've also just recently released the Angular Profiler DevTools, which is a Chrome extension that can be used to visualize change detection cycles in your, uh, in your application uh, and also visualize the component tree in a DevTool panel so you can uh, easily optimize this. All right, so remember, we want to build our own emoji syntax. But before we can do that, we actually have to understand how we build 
or implement Angular applications. Now, we use TypeScript and HTML to write our Angular applications, right? And then in the end, what we get is something, is JavaScript that can be executed inside the browser because, well, TypeScript doesn't, the browser doesn't understand TypeScript. And there's also something inside the markup, inside the HTML that the browser doesn't understand. So what is this magic unknown thing in the middle? And it turns out that this is actually something called the Angular compiler. The Angular compiler takes TypeScript as well as HTML and then compiles it into JavaScript, which then runs inside the browser. Now, let's take, let's take one step back and take a look at the definition of a compiler. What is a compiler? And by definition, a compiler is a computer program that translates computer code written in one programming language into another programming language. That's great. But, I mean, we already have the TypeScript compiler, right, which, ta uh, which takes TypeScript and transpiles it down to JavaScript. That's good. But why do we need an Angular compiler? Why? I don't get it. That's, that's a good question, right? Because we write HTML and TypeScript, and TypeScript can also already be translated into JavaScript. So why do we need it? And there's actually a really good reason for this. And this is all about declarative versus imperative. When we write HTML in our Angular components, we're not really writing HTML. We're writing something we like to refer to as Angular HTML, which is HTML plus a little bit of JavaScript syntax and also a little bit of Angular syntax. But of course, our browser doesn't understand what that is. But the reason that Angular has decided to work with templates is because it's a very declarative way of writing our components. Um, because of this declarative way and because we only have like limited JavaScript syntax, we're forced to keep our templates very simple, which is always going to be a good idea. Another reason is that um, because we don't do anything imperatively, so we don't do the DOM manipulation ourselves, Angular, when it translates our declarative template files to, um, to the more verbose imperative DOM manipulation, um, it can actually greatly optimize that. Um, and for instance, browser optimization techniques that are valid today might not be valid tomorrow. If that ever changes, Angular is going to optimize that for us without us, us having to do anything. So what does the Angular compiler actually do for us? So the first thing it does is going to um, do type checking of our templates. So it's going to make sure that we don't use any variables which don't exist on the component class. It's going to make sure that we don't pass numbers to functions which accept strings, uh, and so on and so forth. Next thing it does is it's going to check and find the, the errors in the structure of our application. If we have a component which is using a directive, um, and that component belongs to a module which doesn't have access to that directive, it's going to throw an error. Uh, next thing it does, it's going to transform decorators into static properties. Decorators are normally executed at runtime. Angular transforms them into static properties as an optimization technique. This is one of the examples on how Angular really helps us with that. It also, of course, needs to translate our TypeScript into JavaScript, and it's going to use the compiler for that, the TypeScript compiler. Um, and it's also going to generate template instructions. So these are the, um, the verbose DOM manipulation um, that it does for us. So now, that's, that's great. But how do we build our how do we build an application? And if you've used Angular, then you've probably also used the Angular CLI. Most Angular applications use the Angular CLI to build our application. But what does the Angular CLI actually use to build our application? And if we open up this black box, for the most people, this is actually a black box, including me, it was a black box. So under the hood, it uses Webpack. And Webpack is kind of like a build tool or universal bundler that can literally bundle everything anything, images, CSS, HTML, TypeScript, anything. So what Webpack takes in, it pulls in our application and then spits out these bundles. And our app is typically comprised of an entry file, which is our main TS, from which we then bootstrap our app module, which is our root module, and then inside the app module, we would declare components, directives, pipes, and provide even services. So that's great. So it pulls in all these, the, the entry file and follows all the imports until it has seen all the files we have for, in, for our application. That's great. So let's dive into Webpack a little bit deeper. What we have here is the Webpack configuration file. And this is the configuration file that we use to instruct Webpack how to work. So we tell Webpack, for instance, hey, this is our entry file. And then from within this configuration file, we can also register plugins which we can use to basically hook into various stages in the compilation process. And we can also register loaders. And loaders are kind of like transformations, transformers, 
that we can use to pre-process files um, as we load them or re require them. Now, the important thing is, is the Angular compiler plugin. This is actually where the whole compilation happens. Now, the Angular compiler plugin generates Angular code that can be executed inside the browser. Remember, we use like declarative markup, which the browser doesn't understand, so we basically have to generate first Angular code that we can then ship to the browser. And then there's also something called the NGC loader. And the NGC loader is just a loader that waits for that Angular code to be emitted. And once it's emitted, it will then forward it to further Webpack processing that involves resolving dependencies and also bundling. And then what comes out is our bundle. That's great. But this is very high level. We still don't know how we build an application and how the compiler works. So let's open up the Angular compiler plugin. And now the first thing that happens that the compiler plugin does is it creates a Webpack compiler host. Now what is that? Well, the compiler host is basically responsible for, for file system operations. So it's, in the end, it's really just a TypeScript compiler host that reads files, writes files, it reads directories, and does all these things. The next thing is that we create a program. And this is a TypeScript program. And once we create the program, we basically kick off this process and start with the tsconfig JSON, where we say, OK, these are the files that we want to include in our application. And then in this process, TypeScript discovers all the files and looks at them. So we have two different modes, build modes, basically. We have AOT, which is ahead of time. This means that the, the whole compilation happens at build time. And we also have JIT. So the compilation basically happens at runtime. So let's take a, look, a closer look at the AOT paths. Once we created the ng program, which is a TypeScript program, right, then the next step is analysis. And in this step, the goal is basically to understand all the Angular parts of our application, specifically modules, providers, components, etc. And once the compiler finds one of these Angular things, it tries to understand it a little bit more. For instance, if it finds a component, it parses its template. But remember, it looks at every single file in isolation on a class-by-class -class basis. So we don't know yet that this particular component that we're looking at belongs to this ng module. So that's in the analysis phase. Once this phase is over, we go on to the resolve step. And in this step, we take a look at the entire application from a much, much bigger picture. And we try to understand the structure as well as dependencies. OK. So the next step is actually type checking, and that's where both branches come back together. Type checking is all about checking types in our uh, component classes, as well as validating expressions in our templates. That's great. And then the final stage is the emit stage. That's where the, the magic basically happens. That's where the generated Angular code is emitted. And so the Angular compiler takes all decorated classes that we have, for instance, components, and passes them through a series of transformations. For example, one of those transformations is inlining resources. So when we define a template URL, you point to an external file where you def have defined your uh, the template. Now what the Angular compiler does is it takes that and replaces it with the require call, and then that one is being resolved by Webpack later on. Once the emit stage is over, we basically end up with our generated Angular code. That's great. So this is on a very still on a very high level how the Angular compiler works and how we build our applications. But I mean, that's cool. But what's next? That, we still want to build in our emojis. Yeah, that's, that's cool indeed. And it was, yeah, it's quite difficult to follow. But I think we're all interested to see where we're going to build in the emoji syntax, right? So um, one thing we're going to use is like Dominic talked about loaders. And if I recall correctly, he said something about that's like pre-processing a file. So we can do something with it. So maybe if we write our own HTML loader, we can go from our emoji-like syntax, and we can pass it to Angular as just like the normal verbose syntax. Um, Sounds so it, like a good idea. So that, that might actually work. So if we go back to this diagram, we can see that we already have like the, these loaders, and we have the NGC loader. So maybe we should try to fit in our own HTML loader here, like a custom loader. And if we look at these, lo these loaders, Oh, super important. Like, if you know how the Angular CLI works, and Dominic said this, is like the Webpack configuration is inside of the Angular CLI, and that configuration is private. So how do we, how do we add our own loader? That's going to be difficult. But luckily, um, since Angular CLI version 6, there is something called builders. 
And builders basically allow you to also hook into the Angular CLI at certain points. And there's one builder called NGX Build Plus. And this builder allows you to hook into the Webpack configuration without actually ejecting. So you can still use the CLI, but you can also sprinkle it with a little bit of extra Webpack configuration. So if we look at that Webpack configuration, um, so before we install, we first need to add NGX Build Plus. And to do that, we're going to use ng add, which is a schematic, so it's going to transform everything it needs to inside of your project automatically. Uh, and then we can create our extra Webpack config file. Now, if we look at this file, uh, and this is a partial Webpack configuration file that we're going to add, it's actually pretty easy. If we zoom in, we can see that we have this rehex, which basically says that this loader should only be applied to HTML files. And then uh, we have our own loader that we apply, so that's going to get a path to the loader that we want. And we're also going to use the raw loader to make sure that it's being loaded as a string. Yeah, cool. We have our loader, but we still need to register the loader, right? Yeah, the Angular compiler doesn't know about it. So how do, exactly. how do we do that? So the good thing is, luckily, NGX Build Plus, which is really an amazing open source library, does not only allow us to uh, register these partial Webpack configuration files, but also provide plugins. So we're going to create another file, which we call ng-emoji-plugin.js. And this is what it looks like. So this is more or less the anatomy of an ngx build plus plugin. So it's not a Webpack plugin. And we basically have access to three hooks, pre, post, and config. Now, config is the one that is important here, because config is called once the Angular CLI has built the entire Webpack configuration, and it's being passed to us. So we can just extend it and do all sorts of things with, with the configuration file. Let's zoom in a little bit. The first thing that we have to do is we have to find the current instance of the Angular compiler plugin, because we have to change it. Um, if it's not there, we just simply throw an error. That's easy. But if it's there, we extend the options, because the Angular compiler plugin was instantiated with options. But we cannot just simply change these options or the existing instance, because it's immutable. So, Important here is that we have to override direct template loading, which is a property, and it has to be false. Now, this basically, this tiny little flag, this tells the Ingress CLI whether we want to load resources directly from the file system or if we want to pass them through loaders. If it's false, we basically tell the CLI, hey, please resolve these dependencies via loaders. So that's, that's very important that we turn this off. Next, we need to remove the current instance, because as I said, we cannot modify the current existing instance. So we have to create a new instance and pass in our extended options with direct template loading set to false. And then we simply take our instance and push it into the array of all the plugins. Right? You can see that config.plugins, that is just an array of all the plugins that we, can, that we have registered in our Webpack configuration file. And then finally, we can just return our configuration file. And that's it? That's basically it. So let's give it a spin. So we have prepared a small application, and this is what it looks like. It's already running. I've typed in into my terminal ng-surf, which spins up the development server. And this is what it looks like. So is, we have, Isn't this the most beautiful thing ever? It and is I, I don't the know most if you beautiful. noticed, but did you see that banana in the box syntax? How cool is that? Now you can actually use bananas. You know in what the that box. is? That's a two way data binding. Isn't that awesome? First of all, I like bananas, and then inside a box, it's mm -hmm. the most amazing thing. Yep. Anyways, this is what our template now looks like, right? So we want to show you that this actually works, that we're not full of, you know. So um, I have my application here, um, and as you can see, it works, it's running, I can reload the page. I can even toggle this so it disappears. I can wow. bring it back. Wow. I am also right. impressed myself. Yeah. That for sure. <laughs> so I can also type the banana in the box syntax works. But what I want to point out here is that I have already, I have already opened the app component.html. This is our template. As you can see, there are emojis, but we can see that there's actually these directives, the more of a verbose syntax of Angular. So there's no emojis being shipped to the browser because everything happens in the build process, and we just simply replace these emojis by the verbose Angular syntax and these directives which is pretty cool. I also have something here. See, I can also make a change. So I have this box and provide my custom styles. Hopefully that box will look 
Oh, green. Beautiful. Okay, so it kind of works. You can also find this on, on, uh, on GitHub, so if you want to play around with this and see how the code works and follow it, see the loader in action and everything, just click on this link once we share the slides on, on Twitter or something. Yes. But, but we have a problem. There is a bit big but. What about inline templates? Inline templates. Let's, let's think again. So what we did was we had the loader. The loader worked on HTML files. Inline templates, are those HTML files? Mm, no, no, I think they are not. So that's, that's a problem. We need to fix that as well. So how can we fix this? Well, let's go back to this diagram. And Dominic talked about the preprocessors for file loading, like HTML, but he also mentioned something about transformers. So we have transformers here, and these are basically TypeScript transformers, which Angular itself uses extensively to change the code. So just like we did with the custom loader, we could probably provide a custom TypeScript transformer, I guess. That, that should probably work. Sounds so reasonable. Let's try that out. But before, let's look a little bit at what a TypeScript transformer is. And a TypeScript transformer is something that's going to change the structure of your TypeScript file. So whenever TypeScript parses your file, it's going to parse it as an AST. What and is an, an AST? Good question. Mm -hmm. An AST stands for abstract, abstract syntax tree. So if we look at, like, this could be a file that's parsed by TypeScript, and it parses it in this data structure. Now, every time you want to apply a transformer, what we can do is we can visit all of the nodes, so we can look for the node that we want to change using the visitor pattern, which we'll see in the next code examples as well. And when we find one of these nodes, we can apply one of these transformations. So we could say that we're going to change that specific node, and we're going to change the structure. So you could, for instance, say that I have a function and I want to remove that function by using a transformer, which is perfectly possible. Now, how does that work in our code? So what you can see here is our own transformer, and the transformer function is actually a factory function. And that factory function returns another function that is going to be used. That's our actual transformer. And you can see that it accepts a source file. So what TypeScript is going to do, it's going to call this function with every source file that it parses, or at least the Angular compiler is going to do that. Um, and inside of that function, we can actually change the structure. So when we enter that function, the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to find the template property assignment. That's what it calls. So we have that template property inside of our component declaration, so we're going to find that property. What is, what is this TS query that we're using? Good question. So the TS query that we have, that's actually a library um, which allows you to uh, easily traverse abstract syntax trees, or ASTs, by using some CSS-like selectors. So in this case, we're just passing it a selector inline template syntax, and we're just finding that one, and then we get our template. Once we have our template, what we need to do is we need to update our, uh, our file. So what we're doing here is we're basically going to use TypeScript APIs to visit all of the nodes starting from the, from the source file using this visitor function. And in this visitor function, we can change the structure. So we're going to loop over that node and then every child node. But in that function, we're first going to check, is the node that we are currently looping over the node that we want to change? So remember, we found our template property assignment. So now we're checking, is the node that we're currently looping over that specific template property assignment? Once it is that node, what we're going to do is we're going to take the plain text, the current template, and then we're going to, uh, using another TypeScript API and our own update directives function, so that update directives function is just going to do a search and replace for the emoji syntax with the actual structural directives, and we get back our updated template function. So we get, we, we search for the template function with emojis, and we replace it with the, uh, we get a template function without emojis. And then the only thing we still need to do at the bottom of this function is we need to um, change the property. So we're going to override the value of the template when we parse it with the new one without emojis. Okay? And once we've done that, the only thing we need to do is we need to change again a little bit our Angular compiler that we're creating ourselves. And what we're going to do is we're going to add this specific transformer in the list of already existing transformers. What's really important here is that we need to add it in the first place to make sure that none of the other transformers sees the emoji syntax. They should only see the non-emoji syntax. So that's why we're adding it first. 
And Ooh. then it works. It works. Everything and works. we solved all of our problems, no? We solved all of our problems. Like, we'll never have to rewrite anything oh. again. Um, Emojis all the way. Yeah, it's the best thing ever. Really? Is it? Is mm. it? Are we really going to use emojis in our source code? I mean, they're fun and all. And they have kind of revolutionized other communication things. Uh, but no, I guess I don't want to use emojis in my no. source code. Maybe, well, we tried it out and it was, it was fun and all, but maybe, maybe it's not the best ID we have ever had. So or maybe it is, but all our IDs are just right. crap. But. So let's take a look at a more practical example. We can actually use the same techniques. And Quentin and I, were, we're big fans of reactive programming, right? Um, with a push-based architecture, we can make sure that our entire UI always stays up to date. And the good thing is Angular already supports reactive primitives for many APIs. But the, the place where it actually lacks is templates, unfortunately. So we thought, why don't we create a library that supercharges our templates with reactivity, right? So this is a standard Angular component with its class and the template. But what if we wanted to get an observable from this button click? What we would normally do is, without any template syntax, which we don't have in Angular, we would imperatively uh, create a new subject instance and, um, sorry, create a new subject instance and then from within the, within the template we would say subject.next and pass in the dollar event, which is the payload. But this is imperative. Mm -hmm. It is not declarative. Kind of ugly. Kind of ugly. And it also doesn't align with other APIs from Angular. If you think about view child, view children, Angular uses, makes, use, makes heavy use of decorators. So we thought, why don't we create our own library that makes this basically more declarative? And so we came up with this. Um, there's also an issue on GitHub that you can find. Um, and so what we do is basically add this little star, so a little bit of syntactic sugar to our template to indicate that this should be an observable. And then we just simply connect this stream in our class with, an uh, with, a, with a decorator called observable event. And that's all we have to do. Now this looks pretty much like Angular, and now we have also reactivity in our templates, which is amazing. It is not maybe less code that we have to write, but it's basically the same. It is at least the same paradigm. Exactly. So, can I has it? <laughs> yes, you can. Yay! So, this is actually a library that has been published for a while now uh, on, on GitHub. Um, we've been using it ourselves. Um, the reason that we actually created this library is because we want to push the Angular framework forward. And this is one of the regions that we, we know that there's a lot of questions about reactivity and templates. So, our idea was basically to give it like a push. See what, it, see what the feedback from the community is and provide it back to, uh, to the Angular team. Our main goal in this is basically to make this library obsolete. If this library is obsolete, the sooner the better, I would say. Um, you can start using this today. As you've seen in the, in the slides, uh, we are using some pretty low-level APIs, uh, but these APIs are supported. We have contact with some people from the Angular CLI team. So if at some point it changes and we need to change our implementation, we will definitely do so. And if it's impossible to change, we can always provide you with a schematic to go back to the ver most, more verbose syntax. Uh, another reason that we wanted to give this talk is because um, we want to encourage you to also come up with your own template syntaxes because it's an ideal way to, um, if, you, if you have something which is quite verbose, quite repetitive, and you, you have an idea for a better syntax, this is a way how you can actually test this and show the Angular team that there might be a syntax which would be cool to add and at some point might be adopted in the Angular community as well. So it's a, it's a nice way to give feedback. Um, yeah. All right, so the key takeaways from this talk are that we looked at the Angular compiler. We've seen how we build Angular applications, why we need the compiler, what it does, and We've also talked about TypeScript transformers and how we can actually change type, TypeScript files based on an AST. We have also talked about NGX template streams, and you've seen the technique that we also use to build this library. So there's nothing new to it. You can actually use everything that we talked about today and build your own libraries and add your own custom template syntax. So. <laughs> but we definitely, as Quinton said, we definitely want you, uh, we want to encourage you to experiment yourself. So, most importantly, 
you can learn so much by also having fun, really. So thank you, Revo.js. Uh, we're going to tweet out um, the slide deck later on Twitter. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Thank you.